Hello, and welcome back to APIs You Won't Hate, the podcast. My name is Mike Pifulco. I'm one of your co-hosts, and today I'm joined by uh, two friends of mine, including the uh, ever-wandering Phil Sturgeon. Phil, how are you today? Hey, how you doing? Um, uh, I'm good. I actually yeah. don't know where I currently am, um, but uh, <laughs> I have internet, and that seems like the most important thing. That's good. Yeah, you seem to be in good health, too, which is uh, usually a relief. Yeah, and we're here today also speaking with a friend Josh Twist from Zuplo. Josh, uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no, great to be here. Great to sort of meet you guys in person. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Of course. Interestingly enough, uh, you guys have come on board as a sponsor for one of our sites uh, that uh, APIs You Won't Hate has developed along the way called OpenAPI.Tools. OpenAPI.Tools is just what it sounds like. It is a open source list of tooling for working with OpenAPI. So if you're listening to the show, you can head to the URL. It's one of those funny top level domains that sounds like it might not be real, but it is actually real. And there's a list of dozens and dozens of open API tooling that has been cobbled together from the APIs you won't hate community, including uh, myself and Phil and Matt Trask and a bunch of other people. Uh, you're welcome to submit things you might want to add. And you will notice Suplo is our uh, prime sponsor for the site at the moment. Why don't we start there? Why don't you give the 30 second pitch for uh, what you're working on at Zuplo, what, uh, what the story is and why our API devs might be interested in it. 30 seconds is quite a tight time slot. Um, we have we have more questions coming about it as well. So don't worry, that's that's not the whole thing. Right? So yeah, I've worked <laughs> sit, podcast over. Uh, no, I've worked on uh, I've worked on in on APIs for a long time. I actually founded the Azure API management product at Microsoft through an acquisition. And I've sort of sat watching that whole industry for I don't know, nearly 10 years, seven years, somewhere between those two numbers. And I just felt that none of the products were fun to use. Uh, there's like, a, it's a red ocean. There's lots and lots of API gateways and API management tools, but I think they have low NPS. They're really not designed for engineers. Um, and I just felt there was time for a fresh take on it. And so we created Zuplo in uh, July of 21 was when we founded the company. And we're, we're trying to bring a really sort of fresh perspective to API management and democratize the technology is kind of our goal. So we want to make it something that every business would consider using. You know, API management today is typically used by larger companies. Um, and I think it's something startups should use. Like, don't spend time on this. We can do it faster, better, more secure uh, and cheaper than if you build this stuff yourself. And yeah, we're going to do that by making it easy, making it affordable, making it fun. Nice. You said a bunch of stuff in there, and I don't yeah. know what NPS is and a bunch of those other things. But first, we have to ask the question, <laughs> what is an API gateway? Oh, is that to me? Yeah. Oh, God. Wow. I feel like I'm being tested now. What's well, a <laughs> gateway and what's the difference between API management is like a constant sort of uh, debate. So, um, you know, a gateway at a simple level in my mind is, is, is sort of a layer, an architectural layer you put in front of your, your APIs that typically take care of some sort of common um, uh, common concerns that, that, that you need when you're, when you're shipping APIs. So authentication, um, security, uh, protection like rate limiting, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, there's lots of gateways in the market. Actually, that, that market is really enormous. Uh, you consider Nginx and um, uh, all of the platforms that have forked Nginx. Um, that exist, um, and then you've got API management, which I think is 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 API Gateway plus plus that takes that looks after additional concerns and really tries to give you um, a holistic way of managing a lot of APIs. In our case, we also try and make it easier for people to ship APIs. So, so one of the things we say, actually, both Mike and I worked at Stripe for a while, is that we help startups ship a Stripe quality API very quickly. And to do that, we take care of your developer documentation. We call it the, the three pillars, actually, of, of sort of shipping an API. You need protection, you need authentication, and you need documentation. Like that's the bare minimum that you want when shipping an API. So protection means things like rate limiting. And funny, like this happens all the time when I talk to customers. They're like, I, some half of people say, I don't need rate limiting because I'm not going to get attacked by uh, Anonymous or this hacker gang. And I'm like, it's not the hackers that are going to get you. It's your customer that's going to write a bad for loop and take you down. And then the other half of customers are like, yeah, this happened to me yesterday. Use effect in React is probably the ultimate culprit for taking APIs down that don't have rate limiting in place. Um, so protection is, is things like rate limiting and quotas. Uh, Documentation is fairly self-explanatory, I think. And then authentication is, you know, what's your approach to auth? Are you going to use Jot? 
you're going to use the API keys. I have strong opinions on that as well. And we make those, you know, just drag in a policy, you drop it, you shipped, you're done, and you can get on focusing on your business logic. Um, so yeah, a quick take on API management and API gateways. Nice. We don't like strong opinions on, on this podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> like to be fair and balanced to all the things. Um, that's not true. That's pretty cool. And so what, what sort of um, users are you going for, right? Because there's there's a whole bunch of API gateways and API management tools out there. There's there's all the, like the enterprise-y Axeway and all of that. Um, there's uh, every one of the cloud solutions, like Azure has one. Mm -hmm. um, AWS has two for mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. um, there's 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 loads of them. Um, there's uh, Tyke, there's Kong, there's yep. little JavaScript-based ones. Like what what separates yours from all of them? Is it different personas, a different functionality? No, I don't. Interestingly, we've we, we've approached this a little bit unusually in terms of persona. I, th I think there's definitely differentiators that I could go into. Um, but actually, one of the things when we, you know, we're a newish company about a year, year and a half, coming, uh, coming approaching two years. One of the things I was keen to do, I mentioned democratizing API gateways. Um, I really wanted to build a product that would span the needs of a large organization and a small one. And so one of the hypotheses we set out to prove or disprove uh, initially is, can you, do, does such a product exist? Can you do that? And um, my belief was you can, because actually the, the concerns are roughly the same. It's just the experience that matters more to that low end. So we, you know, I feel like we've done that. I've got uh, a good number of tiny customers that have like two employees and they just want to ship an API quickly. And they're delighted that they have this great um, uh, they have this great experience that they didn't have to work so hard on. And I have um, uh, customers with 5,000 employees, um, large contracts that we're considering. I won't name any names, but you've already said them um, in an RFP. And we went through a formal RFP process. And so what's really exciting to me is we've kind of, I feel like we've proven that hypothesis recently that a product can do both of those. You can build a product that's easy to use. And that's why these big companies are choosing us is because they don't need to be sent on a training course for a week to use Zooflow, but it can do pretty much everything that the bigger, more mature products can do. And it just fits into their, their life cycle better, fits into their uh, developer workflow. That's a, been a massive focus for us. Yeah, it's interesting. That sounds like it fits sort of the classification of products that like enables a lot of superpowers without uh, having to spin up an entire team of, of wizards or experts or whatever to go and uh, figure out how to... Uh, you know, go around all the edge cases of rate limiting and all of the things right. that uh, your team is no doubt an expert on. Um, I, I tend to think that it's a pretty good hallmark too of a product that's worth looking at when it works for both the small and large mm. teams, uh, especially because that means that someone at a larger company can grow their, you know, their little uh, niche uh, API um, from from nothing with a couple of people to something pretty massive. The hundred percent, and the, the other thing actually, just from a like a business perspective in my mind, you know, I think, I think one of the businesses that's done this very well is auth zero. Um, and they built a product that works great for large companies. They have massive customers, but pretty much every startup I talk to uses them. And that was actually part of their go to market strategy is, you know, people used auth zero on their side project and their hobby project or, but they also worked at big co. And so when the time came that, Hey, we need this identity solution. Um, you know, and very much I hope that's all what I hope happens with Zooplo. We have lots of hobbyists building things. We did we did some stuff with Superbase recently as a back end. And if you want to go API first with a Superbase back end, you know, Zooplo is a pretty easy way of doing that. Um, very low lift, which is great for that audience because they don't have a ton of time. And, you know, the hope is that they'll fall in love with the product and go and sell it at their big company they work at during the week. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, diving in and looking at your docs, uh, mm. I guess, as I was preparing for the show here. And one of the things that stood out to me is interesting is um, I think there's a section in your documentation that's something like um, get started or quick start or something like that. Uh, and the, there were a couple of key use cases that fell into that quick start category that mm. really made it feel like um, if you're looking for these things, the solution is, you know, d dead simple right in front of you. Um, and to the, the two that I recall off the top of my head are documentation and rate limiting mm. as, as, or, uh, you know, just general gateway features as a, as a quick start. Uh, and like, that's, that's a, a really simple way to evaluate the product and, uh, whether or not it fits your use case. Um, and that meshes well, uh, with the pricing tiers that you have as well. So this mm. is me putting on my, you know, uh, startup founder hat, I guess too, but that's a really interesting way to like just let someone get in and use the thing and then go sell it to their organization as opposed to having to deal with the sales team on your side. Are you finding that that's a, that's a way that people um, 
really do sort of join and get started? Like you've left the right breadcrumbs for people to try out Zoopla? Yeah, the smaller folks for sure. Um, they tend to come in, try the free product, and then, you know, uh, we see them in the Discord chat and end up becoming paying customers. Um, the larger customers we've, there's actually a bit of a, uh, I don't know how relevant this is to, you, to the podcast, but I'll share it anyway. But there's a bit of, a, the, it's called product led growth, this idea, what, what, um, if you're familiar with it, what, what Auth0 did a great job of. And it's actually become, there's a bit of a backlash against it in the startup world today that it's not the be all and end all. And I think we see it as like, you actually need both streams. Like our larger customers at the moment, they haven't come in that route. They don't really sign up themselves. We get sent a formal, they hear about us, they're excited about it. They see the demo and that's usually when they suddenly get very interested and are willing to, you know, to be clear for a large company to take a bet on Zuplo, it takes someone risking some personal capital. It's like, you know, the saying you don't get fired for choosing IBM. It's like, just pick Apogee or Congo, one of the big names, you know, it's easier. But once they see what they can enable their teams to do and their teams will actually like using it, they're, they're willing to fight for Zoopla. But that's a more formal sort of sales-led process um, for those folks. I hope it switches. You know, I love it when people come in and stick a credit card in and they're just away uh, at the races. But we definitely see both channels being important um, uh, important for us. But we're very passionate about... I, I think about building a product like this, like building a video game. And I think um, someone did a great article on this. Actually, I'll, I'll add it to your show notes um, when I dig it out. Um, actually, I got it from uh, a, a memo in Side Stripe from Patrick. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it talks about like the best products are like video games in terms of they start very easy. You know, when you, when you start Mario level one, you know, you just got to jump around a bit and you're going to finish. But there's a way and a ramp to like use all the power of a product. And it's like you face Bowser on the, the last level on the, the, the bad guy. But so uh, products in this market, I find it feels like you're just facing Bowser from the get go, right? That's your, like, <laughs> you're literally on the last level. It's really hard to get started. And so we, we spend a lot of time and attention is how do we make there a really nice sort of glide slope to the product? You come in, you've got API key management set up, it's tied to a project. But then as things get more complex and you're, you're starting to want to do some wild stuff, then we, we give you all the tools that you can, you can do whatever you need to do. So that's a thing we think about a lot. Yeah, uh, that's um, one of those things that I think um, people using your products too won't realize it's happening, right? But mm. they'll, they'll have become experts and kind of grown this understanding and attachment uh, to the tools that they're using. Um, and in particular, if that feels familiar, if like that journey is something that feels like they've felt with products mm. that they already love, you know, like, oh, this is just like when I started with Superbase, for example, or whatever, right? You feel like you're uh, hopping from lily pad to lily pad in a way that um, is familiar and generally good. You, yeah. you get the network effect of those associations too. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I quite liked about the way that things ended up going at Stoplight. Um, that was, whether you see it as like a skeezy marketing tactic or whether you see it as um, kind of like that product led stuff you're talking about, like we released a bunch of open source tools um, and, and loads of people were used to working just purely with those open source tools. Like people love Spectral and they'll just use Spectral all the time in this little CLI thing. And then maybe they'll use it in the VS code thing. But you get mm. used to using this stuff from Stoplight. And then you're like, actually, I'm, I'm fed up with editing open API via YAML. So I'm going to go use their studio, but I'll download the desktop one and it's totally free. So these hobbyists and these individuals, and maybe you're working at a company using that stoplight stuff without the company signing off on anything because you didn't need to. It's just an app on my computer. And then all of a sudden someone's like, oh man, we need a, a editor that everyone can use. And there's like five people at that company going, stoplight, I already use it. We're already in there. Um, so kind of having, it's just freemium, I guess, but having that freemium model where you can get loads done um, and, and not try and like kneecap people with uh, all these useful critical features are going to be hidden behind a paywall. You can get so far, but you can't publish or something, you know, crap like that, giving them an actual genuine experience, but then just saying, oh, if you want these complicated, confusing, um, like shared design libraries or shared style guides and things that involve our servers doing loads of work, we're going to charge you some money for that because mm. the servers have got to do loads of work. And I, I think that's just a nice way of going about it. Just like, yeah, genuine freemium stuff to get your foot in the door as well. It's like yeah. a win-win for everyone. Yeah, help people solve real problems as well. And we, well, also actually the, the freemium tier is great for us. Like we get a lot of good feedback from people who use our free products and they're probably not gonna become paying customers anytime soon, but they've been some of our best customers in terms of helping us build a great experience, you know, 
these folks who are doing this not for their job but for for fun or for their hobby or their side gig they're trying to start you know um they're doing it from a real place of passion and so their their feedback's especially interesting to us nice tell us more so you're talking about api management we've mentioned mm -hmm. that gateway is kind of one aspect of it yeah. um but api management is a huge nebulous topic there's a million different parts of the life cycle that you might be managing um and Actually, another stoplight mention. They're not sponsoring us anymore. I don't work there anymore. At some point, I'll <laughs> shut up about stoplight. Um, but um, Jason Harmon, the CTO, wrote this really good blog post for... Um, is it a blog post if it's for Forbes? I don't know. Whatever. He wrote for Forbes, um, talking about how it's basically impossible to cover every single aspect of the API lifecycle properly. There's a lot of companies pretending that they do, but they don't <laughs> because you've got... Um, especially his design there's api design management has, has been separated out as its own kind of um vertical but you've got kind of the designing um which you kind of do because you've got an editor you've got mocking you've got docs you've got c testing kind of you were talking about some contract testing on a chat the other day right there's um there's the whole like developer portal getting you api keys which hooks in with the actual production stuff like what parts of the life cycle are you going for and what are you not going for? And are you just trying to do it all like a madman? No, we're definitely not not yet. I mean, you know, I think maybe there's a world where we continue to sort of eat up adjacencies, but our focus, um, you know, we do have a designer, but I don't think we're trying to become an alternative to Stoplight or to, um, you know, Postman, I think, is, is sort of has some good tools here as well. Um, that's not our intention with the designer. The designers, they're really, again, to give you that sort of very, very easy onboarding experience. That's, that's you know, we're, we're not suggesting anyone tries to design an open API document in our design. Don't do that. I mean, it just won't work. Um, but if you're coming in and you just want to get started, it kind of gives you this very gradual glide slope to being successful. But then if you look, when you're designing whatever you're designing, it's just generating a text file in the background, right? Um, and in that you can do a lot more than our designer could do. So we're not trying to own API design. I don't think at this point we, it's hard to say exactly where the stages are, where they end, uh, where they begin and where they end. I think one of the, first of all, we want to make you, it easy to have a, like a great runtime, like running and operating, uh, an API needs to be great. So the fact that you're protected, um, the fact that, uh, you have analytics and understand what's going on. And, you know, we have integrations with like Datadog for, for logging. So sort of operations is, um, is covered. That's the, that part is the real focus for us at this point. And the reason we have tests is really just in support of getting people to that place. So one of the biggest things we've spent time on is, is what is the deployment story for Zoopla? So, I mean, you mentioned great open source companies, actually. I think like Vercel is a company we admire uh, tremendously. Um, and, you know, they had the Next.js as open source and then the, the paid product is, is the sort of segue I'm going for there. Um, they also, along with Netlify, have this great GitOps model where everything's in uh, in GitHub and you, um, you push a commit and then it'll deploy uh, for each branch. Well, we have exactly the same behavior. So... Uh, we make it crazy easy to deploy. And part of that is being able to test easily. So really, that's why we built the testing. We don't think of ourselves as like the ultimate API testing platform, not at all. Um, rather, we want to make sure that when you're running and operating these tier zero mission critical APIs, as they are for most of our companies, that you're not going to deploy something bad. So we want we want to help you to help yourself effectively. So that's why we have things like the the testing. I am definitely interested in helping teams because there's blurry lines at the edge of that part of just like running and operating an API, right? And managing it. it there's, there's, there is this idea of, well, how can I put it? What my experience of customers using API gateways, like most of the, or API management products in the market is that the, the gateway lives on like an iron throne in the, in the business, in the enterprise. It's guarded by a team of architects dressed in like knights outfits as I'm going for the full on game of Thrones thing here. Uh, you know, and, no engineer can touch it. They probably have to fill in a Google form to make request changes. And it's just it's just BS, frankly, from like how engineers normally work. And so we want to fix that. And so now creating a new deployment, creating a new environment in Zooplow takes 20 seconds and you'll have it live. I have a customer paying for 250 concurrent production environments. And that's because every team gets a preview environment, gets multiple preview environments. They just want to throw, create them, play with them, throw them away. Every engineer gets to do that. 
where we are, where I am interested in going a little bit further is, so how do we help, you know, those architects now, they've kind of lost control, right? How do we give them governance with a little g? And we really want to do that in automated ways. So some of the stuff we're, we're playing with now is that the tests have to pass before you can promote this to the true production environment or the true QA environment. Um, maybe some linting rules are going to come into play. Like, hey, you know, we have a set of standards here. And um, and it, you can do whatever you want on your what we call working copy. That's like the pr developer's private gateway we give them. Um, but if you want to get that into production or QA or staging or whatever, then it's going to have to pass these rules. You're going to get warnings, and then they're going to turn into errors. So there's blurry lines, but really we're about you know operating um, operating a large API at scale. That's yeah, that's interesting. Because that's one thing I wanted to ask about. It's like who who operates it, like who's in charge of it, right? Because I've worked at a bunch of companies where you don't, you almost don't even know that the API gateway exists. It's mm. like, a, or any of the, you know, I, I throw around gateway and management interchangeably sometimes because yeah. they're pretty close, but um, like they'll they'll just kind of like sneak it in. You, you build whatever Rails app you're building or whatever, and then someone will just like slide this layer in, in front and you get rate limiting, which you never had to think about, cool, whatever. Um, and you might get a bit of like edge caching or something else, but like it's just kind of this this like DevOps implementation detail that you it's more like infrastructure, um, but it, it kind of sounds like you're looking for other people to get involved, right? So the the developers maybe getting a bit more involved, but like is there any is there any room for the client side to get involved? Because you were showing me um, the caching feature, and mm. I can absolutely I, I bet like <laughs> there's people out there. Kind of my frustration with how, the way that people talk about GraphQL a lot is that that there's there's lots of people out there that are really upset with bad REST APIs that are then building their own kind of API layer in GraphQL, building BFFs so that, you know, they're a client team, but they're building a BFF to solve shit problems with that shit API. Um, and I can What's just a BFF? kind of imagine... Other than a oh, sorry, back end, back, end, back end for front end. Oh, okay, um, okay, back end for front so, end. So, okay. yeah, like, say, you, say you're building a React app and you've got to talk to, like, six different APIs that all have completely different um, authentication. See. I've been in that situation, and I was like, I don't think that every client should have to build their own BFFs to, to solve all these inconsistencies. We could just use an API gateway to yep. remove those inconsistencies and it would use the same authentication system. But I could imagine that the clients would also have a bit more control. If, if there's just this one shared repo that's a bit less freaky to try and configure than some like hosted gateway somewhere else, um, then they can add some cache headers. Just like you, know, you, you were showing me how to add mm. cache headers to my badly built API and then my client was quicker. Um, is that a use case that you kind of intended or? Uh, no, I, I guess we hadn't thought much about the, the the client as in the person calling the API. You mean just to be 100% clear, you mean yeah, the, the thing yeah. called the API, 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 so API like consumer app or something? Yeah, the API sure. consumer. Um, no, we want to give them a great experience, particularly the developer. We care about that. We care about, you know, we think engineers are craftspeople. And so we, we want the, we want to build something they're proud of sort of saying they have their name attached to. But we don't think about it much beyond that. What will happen is there's there's a company, it has, it's it's typically gotten a little bit bigger. It's not one of the startups we're working with. And now it has like seven teams building microservices. And they want those teams to run really independently. But they also occur as an organization that their API is beautiful, is consistent, and is ideally one single thing so that React clients aren't calling 12 APIs. But that's hard to organize in the sort of, in the setup you just described, Phil, because there's this magical gateway, but how do I add new routes to it? Like, what's the process to do that? So if you can, if you can create it so it's very self-serve for the engineers inside those organizations to add new routes, right? They can just go and clone the gateway, have their own copy of it that they run with, add in a bunch of new routes. And then there is a process by which that goes to production that the architects or the, the leadership still feel like they can manage. Then that... Um, then we feel like that's a win-win, and that's actually one of the things where where folks are really excited about Zoopla. It's one of the, the main wins we ways we win deals with like medium-sized businesses. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I like to ask giant, uh, never-ending questions that are mostly just statements. <laughs> so I, I definitely found your outreach to be interesting, and it's been cool to see uh, Zooplo showing up at um, various events and bringing content to conferences and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I'd imagine education is a big part of this and, and trying to figure out how to uh, make the call to API developers that this is something that they should consider. 
Uh, is there like a segment of the market, a way that you're trying to identify sort of uh, API devs who, who you should be talking to or devs who don't consider themselves API devs who, uh, you know, should be spun up on this sort of information? I wish I had a better answer to this. Not yet. We're we're really kind of exploring that still. You know, we're we're kind of early. People are finding us by one means or another. Um, yeah. Some of our sponsorships, like the one we're doing with you folks, you know, is is great. Uh, uh, so we're sort of our in, it's sort of just talking startup business for anyone trying to build something like this. You know, one of our initial strategies was we were just doing cold outreach and hitting people with like emails and trying to sense when they might be ripe to be thinking about an API gateway. And then, you know, that's hard because um, if someone's already got Apogee or Kong or something, you're not just going to send them an email that's going to make them, you know what, I changed my mind. Let's let's uninstall this thing and let's replace it with Zoopla. It's just not going to, you know, that's not going to happen easily. Um, so you got to time it where they're already thinking about that. And that's like shooting arrows into the woods right. with a blindfold on at night and hoping to hit some prey. Um, um, weird analogy for a vegan, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so then we said maybe a better analogy is actually we, we go and put tripwires out um, around the forest where we think these people are running. And so, like, you know, we did, we've done a bunch of content around rate limiting, around sponsoring uh, spaces where people work. Like, uh, we've had a successful sponsorship with, um, have you seen Jason um by Jack Wooden? Um, sure. So, yeah, that's a really cool online designer if you want to design JSON schema documents using a tool. So we sponsor that. We've had a great relationship with them. There's another developer portal, an open source developer portal called Rapidoc that we sponsor. Um, uh, because, again, like people in that area might be starting to think about like maturing how they're approaching APIs. So they'll, they'll see Zooplo. The, the sponsorship we've done with you folks at openapi.tools. So that's, that's one of the ways we're trying to reach out to people. But I think we're just beginning. Um, some of the stuff we've done, um, is creating YouTube content um, for Superbase developers. You know, this idea that if you're working on Superbase and you're suddenly going, how do I build an API out of this that actually feels like an API that's like not not rest over data, which is what you kind of get with um, Postgres, I think they're using. Um, I want it to feel custom. So well, Zoopla can be a very easy gateway on top of that. That's a doddle. So we made a bunch of content for that, which has gone great for us. Um, so we're still, we're still really finding our way of doing it. I don't, I wouldn't say we've cracked it yet, but, um, yeah, sure. I, I feel like you, um, you laid out the, the breadcrumb for me earlier that I feel like you should be writing an incendiary blog post or making a YouTube video that has a title, something along the lines of like use effect is costing you money, uh, <laughs> and, and go publish that on the web and you'll get a billion I'm making notes here right now. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can put me on the byline for that one if you want, but I, I was great... like, th those are the sorts of things that people don't realize, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, but it does get people's attention. They know they're having problems with use effects doing, you know, rendering a billion times or whatever the case is, but, uh, they, they don't often have the solution to that. And that's why you find the same four stack overflow threads that are, you know, as condescending as stack overflow can be, uh, and, and well, as unfriendly as you could, you might imagine. Yeah. Actually great chance for a plug. We're actually trying to hire a developer relations, a developer advocate right now. Our first a full-time developer advocate would be creating lots of content like this. So if anyone listening to the podcast is interested, you know what to you know where to go. Hope you guys don't mind me sneaking that in there. Um, we did do one. In, oh, sorry. One interesting article that again was was quite popular. When we designed our API key um, service, like the, the fact the fact that you can sort of add API key authentication to an API, we did a lot of research. Like, how do people do this? You know, we even though I worked there, poured over Stripe's implementation because they're still sort of seen as the gold standard. I think of like APIs. I, actually, I'd, I'd be curious on what you guys think is the best today. You know, we looked at Twilio, we looked at Sangre, we looked at all these companies, looked at GitHub, and we're like, how do they do it? What are the rules? What are the best practices? And so we thought, you know, it'd be even though it's kind of IP for us, really, in a way, that research and that knowledge, we thought, well, let's write it up in a really detailed article and share that knowledge with folks. It might mean they don't use Zooplo and they go and build it themselves. It's fine. Go and do that, you know. But also people may hopefully um, see us as someone who's sort of, you know, done some thought leadership in this space and, and potentially will come and use us as a solution so they don't have to build that stuff and manage it all themselves. And that, that went well. And we'll keep doing things like that. Like the way, mm. one of the things that's unique about Zooplo is it runs at the edge. So it's not, it's not you know, it's not um, an Nginx or an Envoy fork. It is built from the ground up. We had to build this thing from scratch pretty much. And uh, so we run on edge compute like Cloudflare and Fastly and Dino Deploy, if you've heard of those folks using sort of um, JavaScript um, worker technology. And there are some hard there are some hard lessons for someone if you do that for the first time and try and build like real infrastructure on the edge. It's just 
it's just different. You know, how do you do rate limiting in a consistent way if there are 250 data centers, each with a thousand processes in it? I mean, how does that work, right? <laughs> so we have spent a lot of time solving that problem. Um, and um, and yeah, we'll be willing to, I just haven't got around to writing it up yet. We'll be willing to share our learnings there in a hope that like, you know, we're seen as like, oh, these guys are real experts at this. So maybe we should just use them versus try and roll our own. Yeah, that's a brilliant segue. You don't want to roll your own. So you want to use something like an API gateway that will that will handle something like authentication for you. But you have just rolled <laughs> your own. <laughs> I'm caught here. <laughs> the, the, because it's edge technology, there isn't really much we could have built on. I mean, we, we probably would have done. I mean, we used a few open source libraries that were compatible with workers. But... You know, things like Nginx and Envoy, they are designed to run like on native hardware with access to like file systems. And, and you just don't have that in this in this technology. You know, there's a bunch of advantages, though. Um, and so we deliberately made a trade off. We said, like, what, what does the best gateway in the world look like? It's like, well, it runs at the edge, obviously. So if you use caching, like, like uh, actually, the, the caching trick we did, Phil, was we were caching in the edge. So when you made your second request, uh, request when, when we did that it was still making a request we didn't set the cache headers we can do that too um, but in that case it's just we just kept it there on that worker so if you'd have had two clients with that two browsers request that they'd have both received the cached version from the edge so that it's not just a question of browser cache we can actually use server caching as well so like a bit like a cdn right because that's what the edge is good at and so that means everybody gets a 50 millisecond yeah, response yeah. time wherever they are in the world um, so there's lots of advantages to building a a gateway at the edge, and that's why we decided to sort of take a risk and, and build our own. We would have happily used something else, I think, if there'd have been something suitable, but we didn't find any. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's um, that's just always the the tough one. I think, yeah, trying to find yeah. the balance of like using a few open source libraries to 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 do. And some we do of it, like but, credit you know, to people like uh, Path to Regex, which is the the open source library uh, that powers like Express JS in Node happens to be compatible with worker technology. So we use that for our routing. Nobody wants to write that stuff again. That's a really great library. Um, although actually I think there's one shipping now as a standard called URL pattern, which is super interesting. So we'll probably move over to that at some point. It's actually based on mm -hmm. Path to Regex, but it's actually part of the, nice. the like it's on, um, uh, I, which who owns the standard, I'm not sure, but it's on MDN and IETF and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, it's actually shipping as part of browsers. And so something mm. else, uh, obviously we're big fans of open API here. I bang on about it all the time um, for some reason. And uh, mm. you mentioned there's a little bit of open API coming to, to Zoopo. Yeah, so a backstory actually. So I have a sort of a love-hate relationship with open API because when, when I first encountered it was when I was working on API management in like 2013. I think it was still called Swagger. And it was a burgeoning standard. It wasn't very popular. And then I went away from the space. And I came back to build Zooplo, having not worked on a specific gateway for a while and still had this image in my mind of open API. And um, we, we started out when we built Zooplo, we have a routing file um, that's a JSON structure that tells us how to route your request. And we initially thought, should we make that open API? And we decided not to, you know, we thought we should own the standard. And what we do is we'd build an import for open API. So it would import the file and convert it into our standard format and what we've just seen is when when people come into the product they click that import open api button first um the the since i last spent time in the space the the perspective on open api and just how useful it is and how broadly adopted it is has really changed and so we really into embracing that like we love embracing standards if they're working well you know we just shipped actually um uh, all of the standard error responses from zuplo now come as um uh problem details which is a new IT, ietf 7807 i think it is uh friends of yours i'm sure like eric wild and gang uh, who who worked on that so we we shipped that recently so all our standards are are problem but http problems and then we're like how do we lean more into open api because this is a great community it's our people and uh we think we can do something really special so we're actually moving our routing file to be completely based on open api and we're just going to use vendor extensions to um, to essentially plug in the things that are Zooplo specific to Open API. And there's a couple of things we're doing with that as well. So one is you can then import. So if you have like your public Open API doc or your primary, you can import that to Zooplo. And what we'll do is we'll take everything that's not Zooplo specific and overwrite it 
and then we'll just keep the Zupo specific stuff for you so that you have kind of a really seamless workflow. You know, I've, I've been told, um, I was actually chatting to someone from another open API focused company called Cusk, which is kind of an open source, uh, open API gateway based on Envoy for, for Kubernetes. And, you know, lots and lots of stories of people trying to write generators to generate a format for Kong or Ambassador or something based on open API. And I think you can really change the workflow if you just actually make the whole thing native that way. So we're pretty close to shipping that that soon. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, a, a good thing to to right. see the support coming. I think we have found sort of the same thing, right? Like our audience, the people that we talk to uh, generally are coming to us from some sort of uh, search term that looks a whole lot like open API plus something, right? Like how do I X with open API? And I think that's a signal that uh, there's been a real change in uh, the way those things the, the you know the developer marketplace has kind of followed over the past gosh i don't know maybe six or seven years since things have really changed uh and we're we're having less and less to tell people to call it open api and not swagger to to that point which i think <laughs> is one of those things that was a bugbear if you know a few years ago and has less and less um been an issue for us yeah i don't bump into swagger that much now actually the word um i don't know if that's i'm just hanging around with the wrong people i'm hanging around with with people like you so so you're all such fans of the of the platform <laughs> but it is awesome and you know people like daryl miller who i missed narrowly when he worked on azure came in to work on azure api management i think super open to to collaborating and and you know giving advice people like kevin uh, swiber uh, and so on have helped us understand how we can do this better so yeah it's cool and daryl who also is currently um maintaining open api dot tools um because oh, we is both cool. are a smidge busy it's really funny it's really funny having um people who work for some of the tools listed on there um because yeah i mean e even stoplight was saying like hey why don't you put us <laughs> at the top i'm like no i'm not doing that <laughs> there's there's always i don't think it's particularly serious but um yeah there's there's always that like perception of uh of being biased and so no we we, we have all the tools on there and yeah it's, it's not it's not suddenly it only is, Microsoft tools listed on that is, website. So Darryl's it is the doing downside a, doing a of picking a company with the name Z when you go into these catalogs. Like we're always <laughs> the last entry on all of these things, and we honored it when I when I made the pull request to open API tools. I was like, I, I see what they're doing here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disrespect that. Can I ask you guys a question? Is that allowed? Fire away. So have you seen since we're talking yeah. about open API, uh, Microsoft? I don't know if they just announced it, but I just came across it on a blog post. This thing called Cadl, C A D L. Um, and it's a new. A oh, I've caught you out. Sorry, I thought you might have seen it. I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. I've I haven't looked into it too much. Um, isn't that the yep. API design language that Daryl's been talking about? Yeah. So we haven't talked about that on here yet, but I think it's a really interesting idea because Daryl's basically talking about how um, currently Open API is is being used. It, yeah. I call it an API description language. That's fairly standard language at this point, although people call it all sorts of stuff, an API description. And you can, and, and he's saying that it's not very useful for designing an API that will exist, right? So the way I've, I've said it is you can describe the API that you would like as well as you can describe the API that you already have. But Daryl's suggesting that it's, a very terse open API is a very terse way of describing what you would like. And you immediately get bogged down with implementation details like paths and headers and the names of query strings and, and everything else. Whereas you probably want to kind of plan something maybe in a bit more of a shorthand, like scratch notes kind of way it is the understanding. I've not looked into the specifics yeah. of Cadill. No, I mean, I we, we going played for. with it just the last few days and we're super impressed. It's like, it's nice. It's very terse. It's very sort of short. Um, and then you can generate an open API document from that. Mm. Um, so I think it's an exciting development. We're, we're not sort of planning on jumping into it too deeply at any point. Um, but I think the great things about these is, is and the reason why we'd, we'd pick open API is, is there's just so much else going on in that ecosystem, you know, from spectral. So w when we want to build this linting, it's like we could just lean on the shoulders of, of just stand on the shoulders of giants there. And, um, you know, all of the things that folks can do with open API that just make it great. Mm. Yeah, you got to take a look at some of those rule sets I was doing um, in in between tree planting seasons. I went back to stoplight for a little bit. They gave me a bit of extra extra income because uh, yeah, when there's no trees to plant, I'm like, wait, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, they had me build a whole bunch of rule sets, and so I, one of them was the uh, mm. spectral OWASP rule set, 
which is quite a fun one. And it just it tries to take a swing at as many of the O Wasp rules as it possibly can. Um, so you could just bake that one in there, like have have a do a quick check and go. Um, that'll get you hacked, mate. You know, just by looking yeah, no, at that. Oh, that sounds great. I'm definitely gonna. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think there was something else you mentioned actually the other day when we chatted um, that I want to. I want to come and knock on your door as we as we start to work on that problem. So, uh, but yeah, no. I... Mm. Oh yeah, things like um, adding yep. um, request validation and kind of response yeah, validation, exactly. yep. aka contract testing. Um, yeah, those things. I mean, th there's just so much you can do. Once you have Open API as your source of truth, you can then do, you know, if even if your tool isn't trying to touch every single vertical in the entirety of the API lifecycle, mm. you can just kind of send people off to the tools that do. Um, so it's it's kind of why I was asking about how the Open API would work. I remember talking to, I think it was Kong, and I think Tyke were quite similar a couple of years ago. And they were like, oh, yeah. We've added open API support. There's this one text box that you can paste something into. I was like, oh, and then what? Like, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Like, <laughs> so like the idea that you just have this open API in one file, that's incorrect. And that yeah. you know, at some point you're done with it, that's incorrect. Um, th there's all these kind of uh, daft assumptions about it. And and so yeah, the fact that you're kind of aware that it's an evolving thing over time and can live in Git and can be updated with pull requests and can can integrate and hand off with with other parts and other tools to do different bits of it better. Like that's the beauty of using a standard, whether yeah. you like it or not. Yeah. The, one other thing we we really love about it is if if we go Open API first, because because actually there's a couple of you know there's a couple of customers using us who aren't particularly Open API. They're just trying to get something out the door. But so they've gone in and they've used our route designer. You know that you you mentioned earlier. Now in the background that is generating an Open API file. Now it's not very fancy. It's not you know it's not it's not as good as an open API file you'll get out of stoplight or something. Um, but it's a good beginning. You're like off to the races. And then if you start to customize the developer portal that we give you, you know, again, not all of the customers use our developer portal. Some folks say they're happy with readme or, you know, Redocly or all those folks. And again, we're fine with that. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I love that now that, you know, that, that people are automatically just getting something for, like some extra value for free. They might not know it yet. But they will in a year's time when they want to start linting that API and they've got open API or they want to start doing API design first. It's like, oh, well, great. We've already got this in Zooplo and we know it's the truth because it is the gateway. That is, I know this is what's happening because it defines the gateway. Um, so we're excited about that as well. Josh, I would love to hear what you're thinking about in terms of other things that are coming next. What are the big things that you're thinking about? Uh, I mean, I think there's a couple of trends, obviously, that are interesting. Like, I think edge compute is going to be important. I think we see a lot of workloads shifting there. Um, I haven't, again, that might be one for you folks to ruminate on as well. Obviously, there's some really interesting stuff going on with AI right now, like from Copilot to ChatGPT writing your code. And I'm like, I kind of got one eye on that going, how is this going to play out in the world of APIs? And I'm not sure. I don't have anything intelligent to say on that, so I'm not going to try. Um, but, I'm, but I'm curious if you folks have. Um, from a Zooplo perspective, um, we have a lot of ambitions about helping um, helping companies sort of govern APIs, but with lowercase g. We talk it talk about it being you know API again breaking down this uh, this silo of the the API gateway being um, being sort of sat on a, on a on a in an ivory tower on an iron throne. Um, and so we're really looking at a lot of ways we can do that. So there's, there's all kinds of things we're being asked. So customers are asking for, um, they want to run these tests we have that we say basically make sure they, that they're mostly like smoke tests, right? That the API they're shipping is not balked in some way or they've not miswired a route. But then they're saying, I want to have other rules now that say someone can't go to production unless they've written tests that give them, and I'd never thought of this concept before, unless they have like 95% route coverage. So, you know, we think of oh, code coverage yeah. a lot, yeah. right? But imagine a gateway that's like, you know, you've got tests, but you're only, you're only hitting 30% of your routes or playing with so many percentage of parameters and leaders in these organizations, they want to be hands off. They want to let their developers do what they do. And so the idea of creating automated rules and so on that, that enforce the standards they're looking for. So linting is one, but this testing is another. So we're exploring a lot of stuff like that. Um, and you know we're, what I like doing there is we're building it with customers. So we're you know we're not we're not inventing this or we're sort of there's a customer saying I want this and we're building it in partnership with them. So 
if anybody listening is interested in something like that, then we'll be all ears and very open to potentially sort of partnering with you and building it out as a POC for you. And then we, we productize it basically. Sure. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. Gosh, I, I guess I'm going to admit to this on a recording, but I would identify myself as someone who's spent a disproportionate amount of time poking at AI to see what's actually going on there. Mm. Uh, and, and I've gone as far actually when I was at Stripe, I was building a product with AI just to show people oh, nice. how to build something using Stripe's APIs. Right. And sort of like a menial product that doesn't do anything uh, earth shattering, but as a result, got me going down every rabbit hole under the sun, trying to find things out. Um, and I, I think from a generative code based thing, the, the things that strikes me that AI and APIs might get really interesting are things like writing better tests and writing better mm. documentation, uh, because it's pretty good at that. You can, you can, uh, have it sort of introspect, um, a bit of code and say like, explain to me what this code does. Uh, and to me, documentation is less mission critical than writing the, the code itself in the sense that like, if you write documentation and it's not great, it's not going to open up security holes necessarily. Uh, so it's a good place to start from, uh, in test case just as well. You could say, you know, write me a test case for this that tests a dozen different ways that zip codes might not work for, you know, validation or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that ends up being pretty quick. Um, I've also found it to be invaluable for learning. So uh, if, if it was something like explain to me how to do this with, uh, you know, Zoopla's management uh, APIs yeah. or something like that, it's good at that. Would I trust it to build a bank for me? Probably not anytime soon. You know, that's a different story. But um, <laughs> it's, the, it's the, I don't know, the liminal space between uh, the, the actual creation of something and connecting it to other things that I think AI is very good at right now. Yeah. Um, I will also say I'm on the record saying I think AI is pretty dangerous because it looks authoritative when it isn't always. Uh, and I'll, I'll drop a, a link in the notes. I'll send it to you as well, Josh, about one it's of the hallucination they call it or something where it's like, um, halluc is that the name I've seen? Yeah. I mean, I've been following it. Yeah. I'm really interested in it. Actually, I thought it was a great answer that Mike, actually the idea of testing seems like a really, yeah. Yeah. I, that, that's another startup almost, right? Someone should just go and do that, like build an sure. API testing company that, that is AI generative. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. When it comes to documentation, I'm not sure. Um, I, I mean, with most open API documentation, it's like param user ID description. The ID. It's like the it's like those comments that say you know the comments say the same thing as the function. It's like this is the request parameter and this is the foo parameter. And you're like, yeah, thanks for the comment. So you don't want documentation like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll yeah. save you a bunch of keystrokes in writing the JS doc that surrounds your thing or you know yeah. the, the Ruby equivalent or whatever. Um, I, I will say I need to caveat this with the most important AI story I have, which is um, early on in early days, I was trying to see if I could get AI to generate an interesting blog post for me about uh, human psychology, like a thing that I found mm. really interesting. And so I plugged this stuff into uh, um, uh, OpenAI, OpenAPI, yeah, gosh, now I'm getting all cross-wired. OpenAI's uh, GPT -A mm -hmm. API, right? And I asked it to write me an article about this very specific like psychological thing. And it wrote me a story and cited a marketing case study from um, uh, Yellowtail Wine. And it said, Yellowtail Wine did all this stuff and here's how they made a billion dollars with this marketing campaign and like came up with examples and all these other things. And I went to look up the campaign that they had because it was like a um, campaign where they were bashing themselves. Basically the campaign was called <laughs> Yellowtail Wine Tastes Like Crap, right? And that was like the whole thing. And, and the AI out of thin air completely made up this entire case study, cited numbers, provided uh, names of campaigns and things like that. And near as I can tell, it never existed. Yeah, <laughs> that's a known thing. It just makes up citations, like all of the scientific, all of the scientific studies and like all of the researches and all of the psychology, like all of the citations are invented for no apparent reason. But it's always like three random white dude names with like, you know, middle initials to make it sound intelligent, it, but done from the University of Kaplan. That's Kaflump. amazing. I've seen some examples of hallucination where like it's getting some stuff wrong or some like obvious math problem wrong, but I've not seen anything that, that sort of elaborate where it looks almost like deliberately fraudulent, you know, with like citation. I hadn't seen that. I wonder what the, the phenomenon that's actually occurring there must be fascinating to someone who understands how this stuff works. There's a there's a thing, I can't remember what it was, but it's like intentional. They have some particular reason for intentionally making Interesting. up citations. Interesting. I, I Google wow. it. Okay, well, I've got some <laughs> reading material here myself. These are great show notes for me and I'm on the show. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm also wondering if the OpenAI GPT API has an open API. That's the most important question here. <laughs> that is the hardest sentence that has ever been successfully said I, in a first take ever in the history of recording. I honestly don't know how I said that. <laughs> I am shocked and impressed. Well done. <laughs>
Yeah, no, I wonder if they do. I know they use Auth0, actually. They're not using Zooplow, not yet. Maybe uh, maybe uh, if anyone has a connection with Sam, we can um, we can get them over. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah. So the, the one thing I feel like I would be um, remiss uh, if I didn't ask you, Josh, is for developers who are building API products and uh, building API projects as side hobbies, things like that, um, where do you go for news? Where do you go to look for things uh, that are not APIs you won't hate dot com uh, or openapi dot tools? Like, how do you keep your, your eyes on what's coming, and how do you know, um, you know, when when changes are coming, like edge compute and things like that? Yeah, I've, I'm not super strategic about this. Sadly, I wish I had a better answer to this question. I mean, I spend a bit of time on Hacker News. I mean, just it'll be like the obvious places, you know. Um, Often I'm looking for, I, I, I probably, it just comes across my path now because of what I do, like someone on the team's going to send it to me or something. So that, that, I, I kind of have like a bunch of curation happening. I proactively spend time where I think people will be asking questions about this. So, you know, I recently found, I hadn't seen this before. I was kind of amazed. There's this site called <laughs> Indie Hackers. I don't know if you know it. I think it's created by sure someone at Stripe actually. Um and that's a great place for conversations if I'm thinking about what are the problems those people are trying to solve. So I'm I'm a bit more strategic about trying to go out there and discover the things people are talking about, the problems they're trying to solve, because that's I think that's where I can come in and add value. Um, I'm not super good at keeping up with um, with uh, all the latest trends. I follow the usual people, Kin Lane, you know, uh, Kevin Schweiber, you guys, um, you know, I, I probably could share a list of, of people I enjoy, uh, Kenneth Auschenberg, um, these folks, and they tend to flag, flag things I'm interested in. But yeah, that's, that's my, I'm not super strategic about it. Sure. Uh, well, that's reasonable to me. My, um, I've, I've abandoned Twitter somewhat recently. And so I've been having to look in different places for, uh, you know, expertise and learning and all that. And, Apart from having Phil send me a link every now and again to something that you know uh, learns me this and that, uh, I've I've really had to change like my my behaviors and places I've gone to learn are really changing lately. So yeah, cool to hear about. You're on Mastodon. I now? am. Yeah. I, someone needs to teach me how to use it. That's the only problem. I uh, <laughs> I'm I'm hit by that wall of like it's Bowser level one problem yeah. right? <laughs> that we talked about before. It is tricky, but uh, I, the the re you feel the reward is there. It's worth it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I will say I benefited quite a bit early days when I first moved over last summer. Uh, someone who was touting themselves as uh, Mastodon's unofficial DevRel uh, was posting some really great tutorials on how to Mastodon correctly, and that was really useful. Um, I've I've um, really just kind of turned down the taps on all of that for myself, like less less Mastodon than mm -hmm. I was doing on Twitter. I started posting on LinkedIn, and I really don't like it. Uh, it's just not like the, the kind of place that's validating for the sort of expertise I seek. Um, and so like, I don't know, Google blogs, things like that, or, you know, podcasts, right. Or where a lot of my learning comes from YouTube disproportionately too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I would go to, to be able to just be the same person. Cause my, my, the people that follow me now are the most weird collection of people of like hardcore old school php nerds and api nerds and then more recently like a bunch of counselors who i like mostly are like trying to get me to help them remove invasive species from their woodland around the corner and i'm just effing and blinding and banging on about yours, computers and then getting really nerdy about shrubs. yours might be the way this i don't stream i follow actually it's definitely up there it's like why am i following this guy again what's here <laughs> it's good content yeah, it's like just here's random. me it's just out there right Here's me showing you how to fix a, a, a flat tire by shoving yeah, grass exactly. in there. And then the next, <laughs> like, it's just it's such a weird mixture of stuff. Yeah, Phil, I awesome. routinely tell people that you are uh, the, the, the person I know with the highest talent for telling people when to go fuck off uh, and exactly why they're wrong. Uh, and, and I want to channel some more of that in my life for sure. Well, I'm, I'm currently getting into an argument with a whole bunch of people because the Wildlife Trust and HS2, the high-speed rail line, um, I just tweeted and said, they're both going at each other like an overserved hen party fighting over who gets to hold the inflatable cock. Um, and they, uh, yeah, that's super professional of me. Perfect. <laughs> well, if we all have something to learn from you, Phil. I anyway. Think. Oh. I think there's a training course there, a Udemy course <laughs> on, on, on the skill you described that Phil has, like, uh, like a, a self-help course. And... Um, there's a book like that, how to give less. Anyway, that that's probably about time to call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's descended into nonsense. That, that, that always happens at some point. Josh, where can our listeners find you and where can they find Zuplo? Uh, they can find me on Twitter. I'm not super active. Um, at Josh Twist. They can find Zuplo on Twitter as well, at Zuplo. Um, and uh, Zuplo.com. Um, I'm super 
chatty. So you can email me at josh at zuplo.com as well. And I will almost certainly respond. So yeah, um, reach out, say hi. Those are easy places to find me. I'm on LinkedIn as well, though, Mike. Uh, <laughs> that's a thing. Perfect. Well, I'll send you my uh, list of 10 things I do to make my work day better. There we go. Over on LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, you also mentioned before that you're hiring for at least one role. Where's the place to go for that? Uh, you can actually just email just email josh at zuplo.com if you're if you're interested in the developer advocate role. Um, it, it is on our website um, listed as a role, so you can email jobs at zuplo.com as well. But I'll be the person looking at them. So, so yeah, get in touch. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for your time. It was wonderful chatting with you, and thanks for uh, your sponsorship as well. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, thank you so much. It's yeah, been great. Laugh. That was great. Thanks, folks.